Welcome to the monthly Truck Stop webinar provided by the Motor Carriage Insurance Education Foundation. Truck Stops are presented the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. These webinars are presented as industry updates and information purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credit. If you're seeking state CE credit, email our office at trs at ibci.net and we'll send you information of these opportunities. We do 12 hours of CE online uh, each year uh, for, your, for the members of the foundation. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. Uh, they will be answered as time allows here or responded to after in a webinar by email. If you experience any audio problems, please send us a note in the chat window and, or call 800-741-484. We are attempting and will attempt to correct the problems as soon as possible. Okay, let's look at the webinar. Uh, we got with us Mark Walton today talking about some technology we can use to help our insured not only uh, uh, be a better operator, but also later we'll talk about how this new technology can help us at court time. We're in a wave of technology, and, and, we, and what the foundation attempts to do is bring you updated just people who are providing these kind of services to your motor carrier. So you in the insurance industry and you in the retail industry can, uh, can take this to your uh, insurers and uh, at least let them know it's available and show them how they can help them. Uh, we got Mark Walton here out of Texas. I met Mark, Mark a couple weeks ago in Houston. He had been contacting our office, telling us about his program. A couple people uh, have talked to, to me about uh, his program and how favorable they are. So the first thing I'm going to do, Mark, is, is wish you a hello. How are you doing in Texas? But then also tell us where you get this name. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tommy, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, we, get, we got the name because we wanted something that was powerful. We wanted something that was uh, memorable, strong, and, uh, uh, and, and we feel like we, we hit the nail on the head with it. So uh, I appreciate you asking. All right. Let's tell us a little about what you do and uh, where you came from, and then we'll get into the presentation. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I, I came from the uh, the insurance uh, world as well. So, uh, for a long time, I've uh, I've insured truckers and I identified a number of things that that they struggled with. Really, uh, a lot of the things that we took uh, for granted in the insurance space, uh, especially from a technology perspective. You know, think of AMS three hundred and sixty or Applied, something like that that really runs your uh, uh, runs an agency. Um, trucking companies had nothing like that uh, available to them. So we set out to build, uh, build a solution that really helps them with a, a few key things to keep them compliant. Uh, we're gonna talk about one particular aspect today, but it's, uh, it's a pretty robust system if, if you think of it as the central nervous system of a fleet. So this is going to be a, how we encourage our insurer to put the these programs as a part of a management system to manage overall. Again, we're focusing mainly on managing safety here, are we not, uh, Mark, uh, uh, versus uh, other things, but uh, but they all kind of incorporate each other. Yeah, that's right. Think, think of uh, a fleet that actually uses technology to run their business as uh, kind of a self-selecting segmentation of the, of the market, right? Because if they're willing to actually manage their business, they're probably a better risk just by nature of that. But utilizing the tools will improve them, and that's something that can be tracked, managed, and, uh, uh, and uh, recorded. All right, then let's kick it off. Let's do the next slide, and I think you can move it forward, and we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, thanks a lot, Tommy. So the, the title of this is, is Keeping the Fleet Safe Through Proper Repair Tracking. So what we're going to do uh, today is really, really do kind of a deep dive into the repair tracking mechanisms, what's available to a fleet, and things like that. So I'd like to start off with, uh, with, with a comment. You know, did you know a third of the, the small and medium transportation businesses, they, don't, they haven't used any technology in their fleet except for ELDs, uh, and I found that to be pretty astounding. And 34% uh, out of service rate is gonna automatically flag you for, uh, for a DOT audit. So keeping your truck safe is, is paramount to these guys. Yeah, even the, they resisted ELDs too in a long ways too. They're finally, it's finally mandatory, so most of the people are compliance now. Uh, I can't believe some of these people are buying older trucks and, and older engines and buying these, uh, buying these uh, 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 conversion cabs and the uh, 
and the uh, glider kits to, to get a, to, to not be able to be compliant with uh, ELDs. I mean, that doesn't even make economic sense because the engines they have, what, well, Mark, you know this better than I do, but get it's eight, six, seven miles to gallon where the new engines are getting 10 to 12 miles to gallon. I mean, that's a, that, that's a no brainer with the cost of fuel going up to $3 a gallon or close to it, that the idea that uh, they can run a few more miles uh, with the uh, paper logs by cheating on them and not uh, and uh, not have the policing of the electronic logs. So I guess people do fight technology. Well, I'll tell you what you uh, you definitely hit hit the nail on the head with that. The the people did fight it. Uh, we're see, we're actually seeing some pretty good uh, some pretty good uptake by the drivers at this point. Early on, everybody complained that there's going to be a capacity shortage. But I don't know about you, Tommy, but I'd prefer work shorter hours and make more money, but uh, that was resisted by, by drivers. Uh, but now, now they're starting to see that, that they, since there's a shortage, they're getting uh, better wages for, for their hour. They're not having to work, uh, work as long, and it's actually working out for them. And, and you're seeing guys now complain when the technology breaks. Well, three things about that. I have every driver I had talked to, once they had electronic logs, they also detest paperwork, and they like them now as far as that goes. Second is one of the things I teach is always blame the government. So now the motor carrier can blame the government with their shippers why they need more money uh, because of, of these electronic uh, logs. So uh, that's a that's a step uh, in the right direction uh, there. And since the government did do some modifications with this personal conveyance. And I have, we did a webinar last month concerned that if anybody did not hear it, it's posted on our website. But now with more realistic uh, 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 public uh, personal conveyance where they can get out of the yard if their time runs out or they can get home once they drop the load and they're off duty and those kind of things, I think that made it more palatable, at least to me, it answered about 70 or 80 percent of all the complaints I was hearing. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that that was, that was probably one of the biggest tweaks. And, you know, the FMCSA has responded to all of the legitimate um, complaints about about the mandate, trying to make it uh, easier to work with. Of course, they had, a, they had a lot of people gunning to get rid of it, so they probably were forced to some degree. <laughs> but Anyway, yeah. so technology is something everybody's got to buy into, agents and everybody else, iPhones and other things that we have here, which I don't even have. But anyway, so go ahead. We'll talk about this thing. And that's the problem, not to be honest with you. That doesn't help anybody. No, that's right. That's right. So, so that 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 was a big statistic. Um, something else that I, I find to be pretty uh, pretty astounding is the number of roadside inspections, and then how many violations were found on the, those roadside inspections. This is a 2017 number. The 2018 number I don't believe is complete, so I didn't use that one. Uh, but you can go to uh, uh, the Safer website and pull all the uh, analysis and um, and intelligence. That that's where I got this information from. So now we see this is the opportunity to take advantage of, of technologies to improve these safer scores. All those violations that we just saw, uh, those can be reduced. The, uh, the downtime that the, uh, the fleet experiences when a truck is put out of service. And of course, the customer experience. If a trucking company uh, is detained roadside, their customer experience uh, that they're delivering to their, to their customers impacted. Um, so safer scores are, are not just used by, by the fleet or, or enforcement. They're also used by, by the customer and the shipper. So now uh, today, let's talk some about the, the problems that, uh, uh, that these guys face and some of the opportunities to improve and, and how technology can do that. Mark, you'll learn from me. It's guys and girls. We do have a segment of the female drivers that we always want to include in this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Even though they are a minority, we, they are very valuable to us. So, uh, so what are the problems? Uh, first off, I'd like to kind of kick this off by talking about the symptoms of the problem. Because, you know, the, uh, the, the problem itself is never, is never really what you see. So safer scores. That, that's a big one, that's what we all see, that's kind of why we're here talking today. Higher insurance costs, a lot of times are associated with safer scores, but, but it's really the, the symptom of what the problem is. Um, the, the downtime 
it's pretty in- incredible how much downtime these guys experience because of, because of improper preventive maintenance. And, uh, and if, if they find, if a driver does his pre-trip inspection like he's supposed to or post-trip like he's supposed to, he's going to find something before it becomes a real problem. And then, of course, uh, we talked about the customer experience, um, the, uh, the time and cost of managing each of the little details uh, from, the, from the administrative perspective. If we can automate some of that stuff, they're going uh, to experience a, a, a better uh, uh, ROI. And then, of course, the, the very high cost of roadside repairs. I don't know if you guys know this, but, and gals, uh, that uh, the roadside repairs are roughly three times and a lot of times up to four and five times the cost of, uh, of an in-house repair. So if that's caught, if any of the defects are caught at the, uh, at the shop b- before a truck goes out, it's going to go down, the cost is going to go down dramatically. Mark, I've always said that the dumbest thing a trucker can do is run tires that are up to the qualifications and the inspection level because it costs so much more to repair that tire on the highway and have it to repair and even if you have to put a spare but how many people got a realistic spare that can be put on there and and, and change that uh, from versus having it checked every time you have a trip and when it gets close to the 230 seconds or 430 seconds depending on where you have the tire uh and change it in the yard versus having it done on the highway that that's just a, when I see that happening in, 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 in inspections and we get a lot of tire violations. I mean, you know, tires go flat. Sometimes we understand that. I had one the other day where I picked up a, a lug wrench. that was on the highway that gave me a flat tire, but, but to put, continues on those, that's the someone I worry about what their operation is when they don't pay that much attention. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good example because that driver's stuck on the side of the road waiting on the tire guy. And drivers aren't, you know, they're not equipped to change a tire, like you said. So, uh, so that that's a, a huge um, opportunity for improvement, and that's an easy one to catch too. Right, exactly. That's a dumb thing. Oh, you got to check it every time a pre-trip, which should be close to a truck stop or a rest area, so you can do. And then every time it comes into the yard, or every time you start after the 34-hour recycle and you start your week again, they should check those things and take care of it with with your local tire person. That's right. That's right. So that kind of brings me to the to the next slide here. Um, so right on cue, Tommy. The uh, the top violations for for safer, and again, I pulled this off of their uh, off their AI um, section of, of FMCSA's website. So uh, these are uh, pretty well in order, but uh, but the number one is the inoperable lamp. That's a pretty easy one to catch, but sometimes drivers don't catch it because they have so many little lights on their truck that. Uh, uh, that they get caught on, and if a driver has um, has you know those kind of decorative uh, extra lights on their on their truck, and one of those goes out, that's still a violation. So, uh, so they get caught on that a lot. But going down to what you just mentioned a minute ago, Tommy, you've got your uh, your flat tire down there, uh, the third one from the bottom. A number of the top violations, and I didn't include all of them here. Uh, on on the safer website is uh, is around the tires and uh, and the brakes. And uh, again, it's, it's really easy to fix. But if you'll if you'll take notice of each of these, if we automate the process for uh, for vehicle inspections and make sure that a, a vehicle's uh, safe to operate, every one of these is addressed in that in that process. And uh, and that's why why it's so important. And you see this massive number of violations that are uh, that are associated. And obviously, the out of service rates are are huge. So let's talk about the real problem. So we talked about the symptoms. We're going to get into what, uh, what what's actually causing it. So drivers don't do pre-trips. Uh, they don't do post-trips. Uh, I visited a fleet uh, up in uh, northeast Texas uh, that has 1,500 trucks. They're all basically brand new, but they don't even require their drivers to do pre-trips or post-trips. They don't even they don't even ask them to do it. Don't they realize that's a requirement? Yeah, and, I mean, and, I mean, they're going to be cited. Think about the DOT auditor. In fact, one of the things we're going to do at the annual conference coming up here in October is we're going to have a DOT officer do an actually compliance inspection. What they look at, but they look at the pre trips and post trips. And if your insurers aren't doing it, I, we understand they'd be fine for not having those things. And I'm also going to do a session about how a defense lawyer handles cases and how the reptile theory of a of attorneys when they don't do these kind of things 
and don't meet all these requirements, it comes up in court later. So that's, you know, the idea to take that shortcut, Mark, would really, if my insured was doing that, would really bother me. <laughs> yeah, it's astounding, isn't it? So, so what, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at ways that we can, we can make sure that the guys actually do it. But, but nevertheless, uh, so, some of these guys take the approach that since the FMCSA changed the rule that you no longer have to fill out a, a vehicle inspection report unless there's an actual defect, uh, I think that's what a lot of these guys you know, hide behind. But it's pretty easy to figure it out when you start looking at the violations. Um, right. so, so the second point here, uh, so the first point being they pencil whip or they just don't do uh, an inspection at all. Um, the second point is the mechanics don't repair it um, or they don't conduct the PM when they're, when they're supposed to. So, you know, if a driver fills out a, a vehicle inspection report and writes the same little thing up four times, it never gets fixed, or the mechanic can't read it and can't understand it. That's a real problem. Um, another one is the fleet managers, they're not even aware that there's a gap between the driver filling it out or needing to do, the, do these inspections and then having the mechanic do it. So a lot of this is an educational thing. And then uh, the last part of the real problem is the drivers are driving a truck that they don't even realize is, uh, uh, is unsafe because either they weren't trained to do a proper uh, pre-trip or post-trip, or they they last time they were in it, it was fine. Maybe they dropped and hooked the trailer and they didn't inspect the new one. So there are a number of things that can cause that. So what do the stakeholders really want? Let's talk about uh, about what a fleet really uh, really needs. So. We need safer score remediation and maintenance. Everybody complains about their safer score because as, a, as uh, an insurance company, loss control agent, uh, one of their shippers, a number of people come to them and say, your safer scores are high, you're flagged. So this adverse thing is gonna happen. Either they're gonna get inspected more frequently, insurance rates go up, things like that. That's, uh, that's what's key to these guys. So they, they really do value the opportunity to, to reduce their safer score. Um, also, the automation of, of you know, these traditionally manual heavy labor types of processes. So, for example, checking for when uh, MVRs expire and rerunning them or updating, you know, some other, some other documentation, preventive maintenance schedules and things like that. We also Those, have that's, that's two things that people that I look at that overlooked and, and, and actually the government's modifying one of these is that you're talking about MVR, but not only you have to pull the MVR, every uh, year, but you also have to ask the insured if they have any violations or not previous as you pull the MVR. And, and I, one of the cases we have in the book, somebody got fined $2,000 for not asking that question. Now that's one of the things CSA is talking about doing away with, but just like the medical, it's not when you update your MVR, you got to update your medical every two years, which does not conform with when your driver's license expires. And now that system where that's being housed as part of the MVR, those are the kind of things that, that smaller motor carriers, you know, how do you put a trickler system or a, I used to have all that, the, you know, we used to folder by dates, but there's got to be a better way to do that. And yours is a better way, I guess. Right, Mark? <laughs> yeah, well, we at Gorilla Safety, we've come up with a with a really great way to keep track of those uh, of those things. And I mean, I can talk about it a, a little bit more, but but think of it as um, as a way to upload upload documentation, set an expiration date. You set reminders, like you said, you got your tickler, and then uh, and then you uh, if you don't update it, then it gets flagged, and you start seeing alerts. So so that's a big thing, and that really brings in the next bullet point, which is accountability. I'm going to go into more depth uh, in a, in a slide in a little bit, but uh, but accountability is huge, and, and fleets really appreciate that. Um, the return on investment, we'll get into some of those numbers, but uh, but it obviously has to make make sense financially to uh, start implementing technology that's going to help them. Of course, reduce downtime and um, the, the customer experience like we talked about before. Um, one of the biggest issues that the fleets are seeing right now is driver retention. Um, the, the average that, uh, that folks like to throw around is 100% turnover in, in the medium-sized fleets. You get about half your uh, drivers that are there year after year after year, and then the other half turn over twice. So we end up seeing a fair amount of driver retention. If we can cut that down a little bit, we've got a safer operating uh, fleet because they're known routes, known customers, products, vehicles, all that stuff. If anybody's here, 
listen to this today has been to the end of our classes face to face. Uh, and when we do the advanced coverage and we do the advanced underwriting and we talk about the, the motor carriers concept, the thing, one of the things I repeat, repeat often are in all these classes is if they only could ask one question is how many drivers have been there with you over a year? That's, that's the, the statistics are just horrendous for drivers who have not been there over a year. And, uh, and so the more you can do to keep the driver there, and this way we're making the paperwork simpler to them so they don't have to struggle with it, uh, that will help retention in that area. And that's a key component uh, as we move forward, I believe. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And, and there are a number of things that you can do to make a driver's life easier. So ELDs, maybe not one of them, they hate it, or they did. Well, um, they did, but most of them <laughs> don't when they get it. So. <laughs> So, but uh, but now now with some of the other things uh, with the accountability of of the mechanic and other things we're seeing a lot of really good uptake. So uh, then we've got the reduced fuel cost uh, that that we get to take advantage of because now we're tracking everything and just the overall safe uh, safer fleet operation. So uh, obviously the uh, the insurance carrier has has some opportunities as a stakeholder as well. Uh, through the automation, got a, a much better view into the fleet. You really understand what that what that fleet is is like on a on an historical uh, uh, basis. But uh, but now you can see what's going on in real time, and that that's just that's absolutely key. Uh, we're working with uh, with an insurance carrier that's uh, putting together a usage based insurance product, and they're going to use our platform for it. Um, and uh, and that what they're doing is they're going to be looking at nearly entirely current, uh, actual current uh, activity of the fleet rather than what happened uh, previously, which is really interesting. Um, obviously, with the driver behavior information, that that's important. Reduced uh, IBNR because you have you know your first notice of loss that is automated. Of course, uh, you, may, uh, you track that the first thought. So we have a crash. I guess drive behavior is very similar to some of the uh, uh, smart smart drive or, 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 or the uh, Linux program, you have those, you don't have the, necessarily the cameras. We talk more later that, but you track when there's a crash, is that, or are you saying that the system uh, automatically uh, tracks that or that's something they have to put in? Yeah, so the, the, drive, the driver will initiate the, the process when he gets into an accident. See, part of the problem with the, with the forward facing cameras is the false positives. Right. Uh, and it becomes it becomes sort of problematic. What we want to be able to do is actually trigger when there when there's an accident uh, that alerts fire through the system, and then if there's an injury, we escalate it further so that so that that fleet manager can react in a more uh, um, in, in a more urgent manner. So, I'm not sure about this combined proof combined ratio. Uh, everybody listening here know there's one way to do that. That's up the premium. That helps too. But yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll have fewer crashes and, and have more documentation to, to fend off these uh, reptile attorneys out here who, who, are, who are just eating up these premiums for uh, by, <laughs> by, by getting these big judgments. Some of that, that last one we talked about when I was out in Houston that happened right after that, the one that did happen in Houston. I understand there's been two major ones in Houston County and in the, in the Houston area in the last, what, three, three months or less. Yeah, there have been there have been a few major accidents that uh, that we that we've seen. Of course, being such a big city and very high speed limits, we see some pretty severe stuff. So the uh, uh, a couple of the last things that are important for an insurance carrier, you've got the the early uh, detection of of changes of the of the fleet operations. Uh, we see folks that are maybe sand and gravel, and all of a sudden they're hauling heavy equipment through a state three states away. Um, understanding this a little bit better is, uh, and earlier on, is going to help everybody. And then, of course, the better customer retention, uh, with, which improves your uh, your customer acquisition cost from a, from an underwriting and uh, and commission perspective. Those are all important. So the question is how how can this all be achieved? So, uh, of course, we touched on some of this already. Um, what we're able to do is is uh, track the pre trips and, and the repair all the way through the through to completion, um, which is which is really important to make sure that this this repair when the driver uh, indicates that there's a problem with this vehicle, making sure it gets to the mechanic and then back to the driver. That's one way that that we improve some of these uh, some of these numbers and, and uh, measurements. Um, 
we automate and reduce the number of times uh, an administrative person has to touch something. So for example, uh, the, the MVR expiration. So if we, if we fire through alerts and remind that, uh, that person that needs to run the MVRs on a, on a regular basis, hey, you need to run Johnny's uh, MVR, you need to run Paul's MVR and Brenda's MVR, you've got, you've got all these um, uh, alerts that help them reduce the number of hours and automate some of these processes, which is huge for these, uh, for these fleets. Uh, we, we're also now able to do something that's really cool. We can track the driver around the truck and determine whether or not he's pencil whipping his, uh, his DVIR. The, when I first graduated, Explain what, tell them what DVIR is. Yeah, so that's a uh, driver vehicle inspection report. So that's that's what they're supposed to do that every time there is a a change in in service. I mean, after they have spent their ten hours uh, resting before they start again with their driving, they they have to do that. Is that not uh, that's the way I understand it, Mark? Is that correct? Yeah, every duty status change is is right. what the what the man or what the rules say. So that's absolutely right. And they're also supposed to do uh, uh, load check within the first 50 miles of, of travel and then every 150 miles, uh, in, or I believe it's three hours after uh, um, after they start driving. So they isn't have that, to do isn't that a, Isn't that a requirement for flatbeds, not for dry vans? Uh, what the rule says um, is is any any cargo that is uh, that needs to be secured. So okay. like a tanker, no. Uh, but flatbed, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yep. But what's what's amazing now is is using GPS and time, we can track these drivers going around around the truck. Back when I first graduated college, I went to work for a building material and concrete supplier, and uh, they had a hard time getting their drivers to do pre-trips. So what the what the mechanic did is he just pulled the dipstick out of the block and hang it on the wall in the shop. And if the driver came looking for it, then he, then he knew they did it. If he didn't, then uh, then he knew that they didn't do the pre-trip. So it, it's been a problem forever. Um, so so it's, it, it's a great opportunity. So now we're able to, since we can track it, we can measure it, and we can uh, we can manage our, our drivers. So what's the ROI on uh, on putting together a system and uh, and implementing it? So I'm going to dive into this a little bit deeper in a, in a future slide, but, uh, but these are the, the five or so, or four or so key points of, um, uh, of opportunity to save money. So one is reducing downtime. So when I talk to fleets and, they, and I go through the program, they experience about one day per month improvement per truck um, of, uh, of reduced downtime because of preventive, proper preventive maintenance and things like that. Uh, we also see about two and a half to three percent fuel usage improvement because of uh, uh, proper tracking, uh, probably less theft, a number of different things. But uh, but one of the biggies is making sure your your truck is uh, is properly maintained so that you can uh, get a little bit better fuel mileage. The paperwork improvement uh, we see consistently at about fifteen percent across uh, across uh, uh, administrative office, and then of course the mechanic efficiencies. Uh, are, are improved too because they can they can get things pushed through the uh, the shop a little bit faster. So what's the downstream impact? Um, one of the greatest things is uh, is accountability, um, and this this has created a, a huge opportunity for uh, for fleet owners and other stakeholders to make sure that. Uh, everybody in the organization is doing what they're supposed to do. So think about uh, uh, think about a, a fleet that has poor safer scores. Up until technology is implemented, we don't know if the cause of that is the uh, is the driver. We don't know if it's the mechanic, and we don't know if it's if it's the terminal manager. Now with technology, we can see which trucks have have the problem consistently, and we can see if if it's just that driver each time, or if it's the mechanic associated with with all of these, or if it's terminal by terminal, and now now we've got a little bit more accountability, so we can we can manage that. I think that's pretty. Yeah, let me ask you a question because I'm doing some work now for an annual conference and a couple of things. Tell me how, and maybe this is too soon. We'll talk about it later. But there's a we're talking about a difference between a fleet with owner operators and a fleet with employee quote drivers unquote, and or a, a mixed fleet. 
how do we get owner operators into this system? Uh, I know it has to be a contractual uh, obligation, and I assume when you install this, you work with them if they have owner operators to walk through the legal part to have them now conform to this stuff. Well, think think about all the things that we're uh, that we're touching on right now. Um, aside from the accident reporting, um, the the inspections and the repairs that's all safety and compliance related. So fleets. I'm not the attorney here. I'm going to defer to an attorney. That's that's my disclaimer. Um, the uh, the way I understand it is a fleet can require uh, a driver, even if they're 1099 owner operator, kind of, and, and properly you know being paid that way, um, they can require them to to use the safety systems that are in place for the fleet operation. Well, not only require if they have to. I mean, they have to meet these requirements. So all that you're doing is giving them a, a more organized means to meet these requirements. Is what what you're saying. So that shouldn't be a problem uh, in that area. That's right. So so they can require the driver to do this uh, electronically because that's that's how the fleet you know feeds the system rather okay. than the owner operator, let's say, going rogue and using paper. Yep. However, when you first install this, though, you're going to have to adjust those contracts with the owner operators to make them to include that part of their contract. Uh, that would be something that you that we'd need to look at uh, and refer those again to a lawyer who's giving the fleet the information because you can't just say, here's a new thing, employee, you got to use it. With owner operators, you got to do some modifications on those independent contract agreements. Yeah, that that's a really good point. I don't uh, I don't get too much into the contractual side, but you're absolutely right that they, they have to keep their nose clean from that perspective for sure. Um, now, the last thing this may this may seem a little bit odd that I threw I threw the claims team in, into this uh, bucket of accountability, but uh, the reason why I did is because if we have automated uh, uh, accident processes now now we know that every day it takes to file a claim, your claim cost goes up. And there's probably varying numbers, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use the number that that I normally do when I talk to a fleet. But um, the uh, the claims team, if they don't handle it uh, in an expedited way, each day could cost uh, cost even more, right? So we want to make sure that there's accountability on on that front too. So so that's good. And then obviously the last point here, you know, the the true visibility into the fleet operations, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Earlier. One thing about claims, so I've just been dealing again with discussion with some carriers. They actually track unreported claims or late reported claims. And in some cases, the carrier, the insurance carrier looks more negative on that than actually claims they got to pay something on because that's the one that causes them the most problems, the ones they don't know about uh, versus the ones they can get early on and early resolution and an early uh, valuation. So uh, agents, if you haven't run into that, you might not be aware that your insurance carriers are tracking late reported claims and claims that only reported when there's a court case or when a plaintiff attorney uh, sends a letter in. I've seen policies non-renewed for that. Right. I, that's what, actually, right. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, I, had, I had one uh, client at one time that took a week and a half to file a death claim. I thought that was absolutely mind-boggling. They didn't get canceled, though, surprisingly, which probably should have been. Um, but yeah, that's a big deal. So I want to take a, a little bit closer look uh, at the uh, at the numbers for uh, for the return on investment for somebody that actually implements these um, uh, these tools, these systems. Um, and this is really focused on only the repair and maintenance part. I'm not talking about the accidents and, and filing those claims quickly and all that stuff. This is just having a, a proper uh, management system. Uh, and, and we're using Gorilla Safety's uh, customer numbers uh, for, for this particular slide. And, and this is based on, on the labor costs that you save, is just basically the... It, there are a few different things. There's in here too, but yeah. Yeah, yeah there are a few different things. So, so the first one is exactly what you just said. So uh, this is based on a 25 truck fleet. Um, and uh, and I, used, uh, I used a number, I think, um, uh, for insurance of, of seven thousand dollars, but that doesn't really have impact here. But normally, when we run through it, so so we try to we try to run on the lower side of, of these to make them as as uh, realistic as possible. And fleets have confirmed that these numbers are are right time and time again. Um, so your document management efficiencies, I, I mentioned this percentage earlier, fifteen percent. 
if you assume three and a half admins or one person per, uh, per um, seven or eight trucks, you've got a value of, uh, of 13,125. Um, of course, you reduced fines. You've got a fairly large number there. Um, now, this is, uh, this is assuming a $2,000 fine per truck improvement. Um, or uh, amount, which is extremely low in the in the trucking space. Uh, fines are typically much higher in the in the four, five, six thousand range, especially when a DOT audit comes in. Um, it, that's the feedback we're getting. The uh, the equipment downtime. We continue to see uh, fleets improve by about one day um, per month per truck. And if that's an average uh, net revenue of $400 per day, that's a pretty stout number of 120,000. Now you'll see some specialty uh, uh, companies like a, a small waste hauler or a, or a guy uh, running roll offs, things like that. They're probably gonna net out about $1,200 a day for revenue, but this is more of a, of a long haul trucker, uh, dry van, flatbed, that kind of thing. Um, your fuel tracking, you're gonna see a pretty significant decrease uh, in cost, twenty-six thousand dollars, and then of course your mechanic efficiencies, based on you know all the automations, moving these documents back and forth, but also being aware of things and fixing them before uh, before they become a major problem. You're gonna you're gonna have a lot of mechanic efficiencies. So keep in mind, this is with uh, with a twenty-five uh, truck fleet, so it's about a thousand dollars a year uh, for this uh, uh, for this fleet. I'm sorry, about ten thousand dollars a year for this fleet. And the return is 201,000. That ROI is just enormous. So, like I said earlier, until until recently, very few fleets had any technology at all. Uh, now we have some with ELDs, so about a third of them have uh, have something in addition. But what this has done, what the ELD mandate's done, is it it's ushered in this new opportunity for. Uh, for technology to be placed in trucks where it's been really uh, an apprehensive sort of industry to, to get into technology at all. You know, the one consistent thing about a driver is they don't want to be tracked. They want to be on their own. They're, they're independent. They're free, right? Um, so us tracking them is something that they had to get over. Now that they're over it, there are a ton of opportunities here from uh, load matching to, uh, to driver retention, all sorts of things. So what I want to do is I kind of want to talk about some of the technology um, that that was out there, and then uh, and then we'll get into uh, uh, what what's sort of new. So what's been out there for a long time? We know about telematics, uh, key performance indicators. Um, these things have been around. Uh, I think Omnitrax rolled out their first uh, their first gear in 1988, something like that, uh, or the mid 80s anyway. Um, so, so they've been tracking this type of thing for a long time. We kind of call it the black and white TV. Um, the forward facing cameras have been around for a long time. The adoption on this is enormous right now. A lot of fleets are taking, uh, taking this more seriously because they see the, uh, the number of, um, insurance claims that would not have paid out if there was forward facing camera, but they did since there wasn't. Um, well, okay. Another thing, Mark, and I, I don't know if anybody has heard this, me say this, we had the smart drive through a program a couple of months ago. What the insurance carriers are saying is that there's more benefit to finding out the driver was bad. They did something wrong because now we don't spend all the costs of attorneys. We don't spend all the cost of reconstruction of claims. We just start early on, start settling it and, and get a mediation and put dollars up instead of fighting it here. And that saves as much money because even the camera shows we didn't do anything wrong. We also, we incur a lot of costs in court costs, but they're saying that that also is a very positive benefit of knowing the facts up front. That's a great point. In fact, at your conference last year, I was talking to an underwriter. I'll, uh, I'll let him remain anonymous. Um, but uh, that, that underwriting uh, manager made exactly that same point. If I know it's a million dollar claim, I'd rather write the million dollar check than incur, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars worth of expenses trying to figure it out. So, and then uh, obviously the e-logs have been around for a long time. The AOBRD technology, which was the predecessor to ELD, came into existence in 1988. Uh, but e-logs have been uh, have been used for for a while now, so that that's kind of where where things have come from. So now now what have we got? Uh, two of the biggies here: are automation and the Internet of Things, uh, or we call it IoT. So 
Uh, I, I want to point out a couple things specifically because uh, because they tie it all together so well. Um, one is alerts, right? So if if we don't if we don't track anything, we can't measure it, right? So alerts allow you to track it, but they automate the tracking. You know, how many reports do you have that you never look at? So having alerts that that bring something to your attention, it allows you to do a better job managing your your business. Uh, it does the same thing for fleets. So we, we really want to make sure that we, we bring everything together. And where the Internet of Things kind of comes from is all the sensors and the, the databases, the computers, the, the iPhones and tablets that are used out, out in the fleet operation. Everything's aggregated on the back end, and the systems are able to, to chew on this and, and, and make intelligent decisions and help that fleet operator now. And this stuff just wasn't available very long ago at all. So now we're able to uh, uh, to tell when the when the maintenance is due because the the uh, fleet operator put in that he needs his uh, his you know it, it depends on the class of the vehicle too um, when an accident happens or you know when something needs to be updated in, in the driver qualification file all these things are important that last bullet, bullet point under alerts though is one that <clears throat> that we think we address very well and, and is extraordinarily important. A driver will take a truck out that's marked as out of service and he won't even know it. <clears throat> or he might know it, but operationally he needs to go get a load, uh, get a load out because he, he doesn't want to get in trouble or doesn't want to be delayed and wants to get home to see the kids, whatever the story is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if we have alerts that tell a fleet manager, hey, look, this particular driver took this truck out and he's at risk because if he gets pulled over and gets uh, gets a, a violation, now you're going to get fines when you get audited. That's a big deal. Um, the last uh, point here, automation through the organization, really ties all these different pieces together. Um, so you've got your uh, your Internet of Things that is driving uh, alerts and all the stuff that's going on, on in the background, and then now we're able to automatically uh, route certain things based on based on the requirements. So, for example, with our with our vehicle inspection report, if that driver marks something and then uh, goes to the mechanic, automatically uh, puts it to uh, to the right status, and then based on what he does, it, it follows it all the way through the system. Automation is key. So. <clears throat> I wanted to talk specifically about this closed loop uh, repair tracking. So this is one of the pieces that Gorilla Safety really hangs its hat on. We've got a couple of patents on it, that's, that's fine. But ultimately, the, the whole point on this is we wanna make sure that that driver doesn't pencil whip his, uh, his DVIR and we wanna make sure that, that the vehicle gets repaired. So uh, I mentioned earlier, um, what happens is the driver in, in the real world right now, the status quo is you fill out a piece of paper three or four times and the driver doesn't, or the mechanic doesn't fix it, or the, the slip gets lost or gets stacked up, and then operationally you need to, uh, you need to take the truck out. Mark, well, uh, that, I just didn't uh, put the two and two together. A lot of those previous inspections were part of the logbook. Now they don't have the logbook anymore, so they, they're more used to this stuff before. But the logbook yeah. always had that, that pre-inspection report as a part of the log. But at least the ones that J.J. Keller got out, gave or yeah, had. Yeah, that's right. That, that's right. So J.J. Keller was, uh, was uh, central to, uh, uh, to creating um, a lot of those documents, right? So, so now, now that it's done a little bit differently, um, we, we have a, we have a slightly different way of handling it, whether it be, you know, standalone document uh, or electronically. But uh, uh, what, what we're doing is we're making sure that these guys are, uh, are, are following the process. It goes to the mechanic. He, he not only tracks that it's done, but he's going to track the cost of the repair, what parts were put on the truck, the receipts, uh, the time, date, stamps, and then reminders if he doesn't get the repair done in time, back to the accountability. And if the, if the mechanic doesn't get it done by, by a certain timeline, then it's going to go to the fleet manager and be escalated. That way the fleet manager can track his fleet a little bit more closely and, and hold his entire team accountable. And back to accountability is key. So then once this is done, you create this record, 
the DVR goes back to the back to the driver. He signs it, and he's he's good to go. Now that he's confirmed that the uh, that the repair is done. So now that we're past paper, uh, we have a new opportunity. Um, paper, we couldn't really adjust what uh, what was being uh, being inspected and, and repaired, right? So now that this is all electronic, we we are able to introduce the uh, the option to adjust the list of things uh, from this standard list to what is key for that particular truck. You're going to have valves on on tanker trucks. You're going to have uh, uh, you're going to have you know, different things to inspect on uh, concrete pumping trucks or uh, uh, concrete mixers, flatbed, uh, reefers, everything's got something a little bit different. So what we're able to do now is, uh, is create a DVIR that's specific for that particular truck. And this helps uh, not just from a compliance perspective, but from a training and reminder perspective. If we're presenting this list to the driver, to the driver every time he does his inspection and he's looking at that list, now he's reminded, oh yeah, I need to, I need to mark that too. So it's ushered in a, a new opportunity for us to do that. So the next thing that, uh, that I want to talk about, and I touched on a little bit earlier, is this automated um, prevent and maintenance uh, system. So this is key because going back to that, that statistic of three times the cost um, uh, of an in-house repair is, an, is a roadside repair. If that truck gets stuck roadside, you're gonna pay significantly more, plus you're gonna have downtime and poor customer experience. We're able to automate this now. I, I was at a, at a fleet of 100 trucks uh, on Friday, and the uh, VP of operations is, is really excited, not just because he, he can upload driver qualification files with reminders, but because he can schedule his preventive maintenance for, for his fleet and have it tracked automatically and, and create a work order automatically for the mechanic. And it goes into the mechanics queue on the right day. Um, it's, a really, it's a really solid uh, way to help improve your, improve not just your safer, but your, uh, uh, your financial um, aspect of your business too. Yeah, preventive maintenance is a, a big key to, like we mentioned, to everything here. And that would be very useful. I, I imagine even smaller fleets would be beneficial for this. I know there's got to be economic level before they can afford your program. But uh, still, that, that, that becomes a factor, too. For them. You know, the way we look at this is any fleet that is about, uh, about five trucks and up can really utilize a system like this. Because when you get below five, you normally have an owner-operator kind of scenario. He might have... Uh, you know, four trucks, he drives one, that kind of thing. And he's generally not as willing to, to proactively manage his business. But we really see that cut off at, uh, uh, at five or six trucks where, where the attitudes change dramatically from just owner operator to business owner. So this is, a, this is an interesting um, slide, and I don't know how many folks are even really aware of, of some of the rules of, of roadside inspection. So um, if you have a, a, a driver that gets pulled over and, um, and put out of service roadside, he has to report that to his, uh, his main office within 24 hours. So there are many times gaps. Um, I don't know how, how many times uh, wow. uh, you walk into a fleet and, and you, you start talking to them about their, their violations and they lament that the drivers don't even tell them about them. Um, that, that's a violation. That's a fine. And, I, actually, I actually asked an officer about that follow-up requirement because if it's a val even if they're not put out of service, they get a violation and they get a, and that violation has to be reported back to the officer that has been repaired. And I made a comment, what happens if, particularly an owner-operator doesn't bring it into the fleet because that's their dollars they got to spend, not the fleet dollars. And they said, well, that encourages us to go knock on their door. <laughs> so that's a, a big part of that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, they, they're reporting this back. Now, now what is uh, available to, to drivers and fleets is going into an app and marking it as a DOT roadside inspection taking a picture of everything that the officer is writing them up for, creating uh, essentially uh, a vehicle inspection report, getting that to the mechanic uh, so that it can be tracked. We got, we've got all the receipts, we've got the date time stamps, and all the records are in one place. And why this is important 
is because at the time of an audit, what the auditor is going to do is they're going to go in and they're going to ask for the DVIR from when that driver took that vehicle out. They're going to ask for the roadside inspection, which they already have. They're going to ask for the receipts that it was completed and then a follow-up DVIR. They're going to want all those things uh, in one congruent place or file so that they can prove that that was done before, that the repair was done before the truck was taken back out, or it's going to be a $5,000 a day fine, which is pretty, pretty astounding. Um, but this is a huge opportunity for fleets to, uh, to de-risk their, their organization. So other new technology, sensors, we have the ability to capture a bunch of data from the ECM. Um, and what this, is, what this allows is for the, uh, uh, the ability to create work orders automatically off of what, uh, what information is coming off of the ECM. Now this varies from vehicle to vehicle. There are different kinds of networks. A passenger car is called an OBD2. Um, large vehicles might have a 1787 or a 1939. That's just in industry jargon. Uh, really, but ultimately the point is you have different networks. Uh, so depending on the device, you, you can capture certain things. There's something like 30,000 different engine codes that you can get off these various networks at this point. It's pretty enormous. Um, the, uh, uh, you, one of the other things that we think is pretty cool is you can record any of these, uh, any of these readings so that when you bring the vehicle back in for, uh, for preventive maintenance, then that mechanic can check those different parts that might be, uh, uh, might be indicating these, these particular uh, trouble codes. So one of the things that I showed on the slide earlier is uh, the number of vehicles that were placed out of service in 2017 uh, for air pressure and, uh, and leaks. That was uh, 56,000 different vehicles. Um, so what we have now is the ability to, to check the air pressure and monitor that on a regular, you know, as the vehicle's going down the road and nearly eliminate that particular thing. Let me, are you, are you checking the air pressure in the tires or the air pressure in the air system? Uh, these are, these are hub, hub mounted and it's oh, in, the, uh, it's in the tire. You check the tires too, because obviously you have the air leaks too, but that, that, that I just want to make sure you check probably monitoring both. Are you not uh, Mark? Yeah, you're mon well, you're monitoring the, the brake system. That's right. Uh, yeah. That would be the, the air pressure and the brake system, but you also are monitoring the tires. Okay. Yep. That's right. That's right. So where does the, uh, does the fleet use this, uh, this technology uh, or I guess really why? Um, so the, the top thing is um, any business has to manage, uh, manage your customer, customer expectations and experience. And if you are able to leverage technology, you're going to do a better job getting that load delivered on time. Uh, you're going to be a more professional operation that your, uh, your driver attention is going to be better. And, uh, and your customer is, again, going to feel, feel the, uh, the benefits of that. Mark, uh, I won't stop. You're used to talking to truckers about this, and obviously t the audience we're hearing is retail agents. So you can also take the same words to retail agents because now you're offering something to your customers, the motor carrier, to make their job a little easier. And also use the fear of lawyers and the government, uh, both of them. This is going to be easier for them to handle a court case. This is going to be easier for them to go through the inspections. So what you're arming them with is, is technology that allows them to monitor their operations, but at the same time to avoid the fines, keep the government out of their backyard, and also when the crash happens, have enough documentation that the lawyers now have ability to defend the insured's actions uh, versus just he says, she said. So that's the customer here for the audience you're talking to here. Yeah, that, that's right. Thanks for, thanks for that point. So, uh, and, and the other thing that you said there that I, that I really liked was the, the idea of the, um, the lawyer on the other side picking apart the, the trucking company because anytime there's an accident, they can go in and pick apart this, this pre-trip inspection, post-trip inspection, you know, ask, you know, when, do, when did you do it? Do you think 15 minutes is adequate? Because 15 minutes is the rule of thumb. Um, it's, it's, there's no required period of time or minimum or maximum, but 15 minutes is, is kind of the industry norm, what people throw around. But if you actually inspect a truck, that's not nearly long enough. Um, so these attorneys will pick these apart to make sure that 
uh, that you've got best practices in place as a fleet, and um, and that ends up being one of the uh, one of the places where where the cases really fall apart. And of course, uh, so the second point here with the training of a of a driver, um, it makes training a lot easier if you've got a, a, a list. It's like a multiple choice question, right? So if you're looking at a list of things to to check, and then you can take pictures, make it makes things a lot easier. And of course, uh, what what I say all the time is is you can't uh, manage what you don't measure, and you can't measure what you don't track. So being able to track everything is is important. So at the end of the day, adoption is uh, is the the word of the day. We've got to we've got to get this to the point where uh, where fleets actually adopt it and they they use it. They they onboard. They get their drivers to use it. So the first point here is the ELD has really opened up the opportunity. Uh, insurance carriers we see on a very regular basis now, uh, if not requiring technology in vehicles, very much encouraging it. We see this, uh, uh, and not just at the insurance carrier level, but also even at the uh, MGA level, uh, and, uh, and sometimes even the brokerage level. We, we also see it in captives. Um, the, uh, uh, the awareness of of what's available out there is really uh, is really helping with the the reduction in the driver resistance, um, and then obviously the uh, the huge ROI available to to fleet they they can really appreciate these um, um, these numbers. I mean, two hundred one thousand uh, dollars with a ten thousand dollar investment is pretty uh, pretty incredible. And uh, so, what what are some of the uh, some of the costs? So there are different systems that are available. Um, some are very very basic with just an ELD. Some focus on uh, on telemetry uh, and, and driver behavior. And then there there are some that are on the full uh, the full fleet management system, like what we do. Um, now let me let me. Now you're not offering electronic log devices, and you're not offering any of the camera systems, correct? Or is that a part of your program? Yeah, we, we actually do the uh, electronic logging devices. Are um, you, you provide EDL with the system, okay? Yep, yep. Okay. And, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the cameras, we, we don't have a camera system right now. We are happy to integrate with, uh, with anybody that's got, got a system out there. Yeah, the two big ones, they're, they're getting way ahead of technology, so you got to have a, a finite number, enough numbers of these things to be able to afford it. But I just want to make sure we are talking about, so you have either with or without, do they have to use ULDs, electronic log devices, to use your system, or is that something that also comes with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So, so our system, just a, a very brief rundown, uh, offers the, the ELD, the fleet management system like we talked about, the driver qualification files, truck files, company files, automated policies and procedures that require the driver to sign, you know, the, the seatbelt policy and other things. Um, and that's all, we offer that all at $30 a month. So that's um, a part of H, HR, you're helping them comply with HR also. That, that's yeah, good. So, so because think about think about actually, a loss control visit. That's that's how a lot of this system was built. Was what what a loss control specialist is going to look for when he comes. We're out. actually going to our next webinar coming up. We're working on doing a, 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 a employee practice liability, so we can build on that for our next webinar, next truck stop. We're going to do and working on that next week. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That sounds good. And uh, some of these systems are even up to well north of a hundred dollars a month per truck, and. Um, uh, you know, a lot of those we liken to the black and white TV, uh, $2,000 installation costs, things like that, that, that get pretty enormous. But uh, that's kind of the cost to, to a fleet to give you an idea of, of what the investment would be. And, and uh, the opportunity to manage these fleets and segment the market, manage your, uh, your loss ratio within the, uh, the particular book of business is, is pretty immense now. And Mark, I assume uh, that you are able to contact them and do more demo for the retail agents and figure out a way for the retail agents to be involved in this process and get credit for recommending these things and, and things like that. I know you came from the retail agent industry, and uh, we had, as you know, uh, we had a couple of talks uh, when I was with you in Houston with a few retail agents, how they could use this. But that's a good positive part here. And uh, your contact information is on the next slide if you want to do that. And, yeah, and that, that's right. So, so thank, thanks for bringing that up. So, we are uh, more than glad to uh, to sell our product through retail agents. 
Um, if you have uh, if you have somebody that you think may be a good fit for this, contact me. Uh, that's my my email address and cell phone number. Or you can go to our website and check out more. We've got some videos there that give you a quick demo, and uh, and we'd be glad to help. And they can download. Well, this this webinar is available for them to download either before the truck stop or after uh, what they want to do uh, in that. But Mark, technology is is the wave of the future, and and this is just a way to consolidate a lot. Of, you're bringing a lot of different things involved besides the LEDs. That's a good point here. Doing the other necessity, and that's monitoring the the vehicle activities, the maintenance, and all that. This is this is easy in the to do this uh, tech, with all this new technology. Thank you for giving your time, Mark, today. I appreciate uh, you being with us, and, uh, and I look forward to uh, us continuing doing this later. And for you who are remember this, the next truck stop will be September 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These are from members of the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation. So anybody in your office who, are, who needs to hear this, please pass it on. And also, you can encourage your insurers to participate in this. If you have any questions, just give us a call. With that, we're out of here.